Hey Dad, I'm here, and I got stuff for the party. So when do you think everybody's gonna... Dad? It was just terrible, it was just, it was just god awful. What are you, what are you talking about? Where's mom? We were just sitting here trying to get a little into you know, the Christmas mood. And we watched this movie and now well, your mom, she just ran in the office and she won't come out. It's a lie. Christmas. Christmas is a lie. It's been a lie. It's a whole lie. It's all a lie. What were you watching? Saving Christmas. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, I just don't see the point anymore. I mean, what's the point of Christmas when people can make silly, illogical, faith-based arguments, you know? Which, in and of themselves, are a fallacy. In matters of faith, there is no debate. Second rule of logic. Exactly. But to come out and say that you have to be materialistic in order to be spiritual in a time of caring and sharing, it makes you not even want to be concerned or care about the season. Okay, I get it. You watched a bad movie and it's totally put you off Christmas. But let me think about it this way. Maybe you're completely wrong. Are you trying to turn this into a satire of the movie? Yes, but don't pay attention to it, otherwise it's meta-humor. And I absolutely hate meta-humor. Just go with it, okay? Okay. Oh, jeez. What do you mean? Well, think of it this way. Yes, the movie is mean-spirited. It completely whitewashes the history of the church and Christmas. And it blatantly states it lies. But actually, it's kind of funny. Okay, close your eyes. Picture it. It's set at a Christmas party where everyone is an evangelical Christian. Yet, statistically, since they're all work friends, there should be at least one person there from a different faith. They try to make an argument about a swaddling cloth, but since the swaddling cloth is never mentioned in the Bible, the metaphor of bookending the story of Jesus in shrouds is completely pointless. They make Saint Nick a Viking! <laughs> yeah, you're right. Ah, uh, see? There you go. See, you were thinking about this as a Christmas movie, not as a bad movie. <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess you're right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll go talk your mom down off of the ledge. Why don't you go start the food for the party? Sounds good. But before we get into any of that... Oh, jeez. Here it comes. Hey, y'all. I'm Derek, and welcome to Bad Movie Fry Night. And tonight, we're talking about saving Christmas. And we're going to save Christmas from saving Christmas. I love this time of year. The giving of gifts, the getting together of friends and family, the food, the camaraderie. It's a wonderful tradition of celebration of life and goodwill. But there are those out there who always yell that Christmas is under attack because people say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas and Starbucks has a red cup. One of the movies that exploits this terribly is 2014's Saving Christmas. Saving Christmas is the passion project of writer-director Darren Doan and star Kirk Cameron. 
both of whom are born-again Christians who take their faith extremely seriously. Darren Doan was a director of music videos in the 1990s, most notably his work with Blink-182. Remember the iconic What's My Age Again video? Yeah, he directed it. Kirk Cameron was a child actor most known for his work on Growing Pains, and converted to evangelical Christianity when his girlfriend at the time exposed him to the faith. Upon his conversion, he decided to use his acting chops to further his Christian causes, from speaking against evolution to starring in nearly every major Christian exploitation film since the year 2000. So in 2014, Doan and Cameron got together and made an evangelical storm of bad storytelling known as Saving Christmas. And since it's set in a Christmas party, and I'm getting ready for a Christmas party, I'm going to make four things today. Eggnog, mulled wine, a cheese ball, and crab rolls. Right now, I'm starting on the eggnog. In this pan, I've got about four cups of milk, mixed with a teaspoon and a half of vanilla, some nutmeg, and some cinnamon. And in this bowl, I've got 12 egg yolks. Now, don't throw away the whites just yet. You can freeze them and make them into meringues later. So for the milk, I'm just going to heat it slowly so it does not scold and bring it to a boil. Once it comes to a boil, take off the heat. Now I'm just going to beat these egg yolks. So let's get started. Our movie begins with Kirk Cameron doing his version of drinking out of cups. Okay, he's talking about why they made this movie, but it's so random and stream of conscious that it's sort of amazing how terrible it is. Also, he talks about how he loves hot chocolate, but it's so obvious that the cup he's drinking from is empty. Seriously, you couldn't afford a packet of Swiss Miss? The marshmallows are free, man. Oh, I'm sorry, now we're in the Game of Thrones and Kirk's talking about stories. What? And we're not even five minutes into this. Okay, so I've warmed the milk and the eggs are beaten, so we're going to start tempering the eggs. This is how you introduce hot liquid to egg yolks so that they don't curdle. Stirring constantly, you add just a little bit of the liquid at a time until the temperature is good enough to add the rest of the liquid. After this, I'm just going to add some cream and I'm going to add some bourbon. What, you thought I was going to remain sober for this movie? I have to put my inner critic to sleep, otherwise he's going to rupture my spleen. Anyway, after some cartoon credits, we're at a party, where Kirk Cameron is stalking the hot chocolate, and we're introduced to the other lead in this film, director Darren Doan playing Christian, because naming him subtle would have been too ironic, who's acting like a grumpy Gus. After some padding pretending to be characterization, Kirk finds Christian in his car and goes in to talk to him where we learned this. Come here, and I, and I look at everything, I look at, I look at, I look at the food, I look at the, I came with it. And that money spent, how many kids could we have fed? So this is my first major problem with the film, other than everything else. Christian is a humbug, feeling depressed that so much money went into this party instead of giving the money to charity. That's a valid motivation, except for one problem. He's the host of the party. He had several times to talk about his problems during the planning process, but instead he remained silent and decided to be depressed at the party, ruining the party for his family. This is not endearing. This is abusive behavior. Christian, you had your chance and you squandered it. I can think of three different types of ways this could have been solved before the party. One your family could have agreed not to have the party. Two, your family could have agreed to have a small family party and only invite close family and friends, giving the rest of the budget to charity. Three, you could have made it a charity event if you wanted to have such a big party. Ask all of your friends and family for a $10 donation and then donate all the proceeds to Doctors Without Borders or Mercy Ships or the charity of your choice. Instead, you have to act like a jerk. Anyways, the second thing on the list is mulled wine. In this pot, I've got a bottle of white wine and a bottle of red wine, and I've made a little satchel of cheesecloth and filled it with cinnamon, nutmeg, and ginger. I'm heating this over low heat just so that it can release all those flavors without boiling off the alcohol. 
And now we come to the part which I like to call the three apologies of Kirk Cameron. Apology is in the classic sense here, meaning argument. The first one comes from Christian making a point that his nativity scene is in the corner of the room with all of this commercialism taking the forefront. If that's the problem, then Kirk should just say, hey, then move it to a place of prominence, like the center of the mantle, and put everything else around it to symbolize the birth of Jesus is why we celebrate. See, I'm not even a decorator and I figured out the solution. I should still charge them $50. Anyway, Kirk goes on to make a moot argument in which he brings prominence to a swaddling cloth, stating it's foreshadowing Jesus' death. What I love is how Christian seems to have a Keanu Reeves-esque woe moment, thinking the swaddling cloth is the most profound thing he's ever heard. Dude, this is the kind of argument a sophomore literary major makes in college and is just about as annoying. Okay, so time for more padding. This time, in the form of two guys talking about the supposed war on Christmas. All right, man, check this out. We got to go on the offensive. It's like the rapper Sugar Free said, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. They're already taking away our freedom of speech. I can't say Merry Christmas at work no more. I have to say Happy Holidays, but I am not. Padding, this is all padding, this is all padding, get to the point. And I love how lazy this shot is. You see, they have cups over their faces so they don't have to speak and just ADR the voices in later. It's so lazy, but they try to cover up how lazy it is by making it seem secret. So it's just even lazier. You see, I can do it too. Now let's make the cheese ball. In this bowl, I've got about a pound of softened cream cheese. And to that, I'm going to add a three quarters of a pound to a whole pound of shredded cheddar. There you go. Now, I'm going to add some garlic powder, some onion powder, and then I'm going to add salt and pepper to taste. Then we're just going to use our hands and form it into a ball. Now we get to the second apology, talking about the Christmas tree. Christian also brings up that Christmas trees are pagan idolatry, and Kirk, as the smug dirtbag he is, he just berates Christian for having questions, and then comes up with another argument saying that the trees represent the cross Jesus died on. I'm just saying that's kind of dark, making a celebration of Jesus' birth by reminding everyone of his death. And truthfully, the metaphor he uses is stretched so thin you can see through it. How is this a 78 minute movie? I feel like I've been talking about it for hours. This movie is so padded that if you fell from a hundred foot drop onto this DVD, you'd survive without any injury. Okay, so now I've mixed the cheese ball, so I'm just gonna form it into a ball shape. Then I'm going to roll it in some crushed pecans. Then I'm gonna let this sit in the fridge until it's ready to serve. And I'm going to serve it with some assorted crackers. Okay, now we've finally gotten to the last apology. And this by far is the farthest stretching. It's about Santa Claus. But because they couldn't afford to show how it really happened, as in it was in a cathedral and everyone was wearing these brilliant Cossacks, they made it like Game of Thrones. Basically, Kirk is retelling the story of St. Nicholas at the Council of Nicaea, where he allegedly did smite a colleague across the face. However, instead of using the literal translation from Old English, which means to strike, i.e. he slapped the man across the cheek, he makes St. Nicholas into a bloodthirsty, murdering psychopath. Seriously, he's literally just killed a man, and look at that face. If that doesn't say, let me show you my crawl space, I don't know what does. Seriously, that's the look Charles Manson gave before he told the family to kill Sharon Tate. So let's make some crab rolls. In this bowl, I've got some crab meat and some mayonnaise. To that, I'm going to add some lemon juice, some bay seasoning, a little salt and pepper to taste. And after it's all mixed, I'm going to put it on a crusty roll with a slice of lettuce. Okay, so Kirk has finally bewitched Christian into feeling the Christmas spirit, probably through the magic of his twinkling eyes, because his arguments were flimsy. So Christian decides to make a scene and re-enter the party, at which point Kirk tells us through voiceover that presence under the tree represents the new Jerusalem. What happened to the old one? Anyways, Christian spends an awful long time looking at this, then gets up, goes to his wife, 
apologizes for being a hashtag first world problems kind of wet blanket and says he has a gift to give. I went ahead and just organized a hip hop dance crew that encompasses all the joy and gospel burst and excitement that I alone as one man just cannot express. Okay, let me explain why this is absolutely wrong. Firstly, we're expected to believe that in the three minutes real time, or eight minutes movie time, Christian was able to regain the Christmas spirit, seek volunteers who could dance, choreograph a five minute dance routine, apologize to his wife, and announce the dance recital. Second, who are they dancing for? The audience is either screen right or background, but everyone's pointed to the camera. You can't break the fourth wall so late in the movie unless you've established that the characters are able to do that. To this point, no one's broken the fourth wall, unless you count Kirk, which I don't, for the specific reason that he did it in the prologue which was more of a preamble, so it's separate from the original movie. And voiceover narration doesn't count, as that's just a framing device. So these people are literally dancing for no one. And thirdly, this is just more padding. It adds nothing to the overall story, it just exists to make the movie longer for a theatrical release. If you chopped out all of the padding from this film, it would be less than 30 minutes. And we're still not done. Okay, so after all that nonsense, everyone goes and eats. Kirk, in voiceover, explains that it's okay to be lavish and materialistic at this time of year because it's the celebration of God taking a material form. So yeah, 2,000 years of tradition just down the drain, and basically Kirk says as much. He goes on to pontificate how we need to make new stories to explain our ancient traditions, in order to make them more Christian. So basically, he's just admitted that he's been lying throughout this whole movie. Figured as much. Finally, this movie draws to an end. But wait! There's a full five minutes of bloopers embedded in the credits. That's how you barely make an 80 minute running time. Don't worry, I'm not going to put you through all that. Just watch the movie and see what I'm talking about. Okay, now that everything's done, we're just going to lay it out in a very festive manner and let people pick and choose as they wish. So, final thoughts on the film. This is a terrible Christmas movie. The arguments Kirk Cameron presents are fallacious, and he basically admits it when he talks about coming up with new stories to share. The whole point of the film turns out to be, it's okay to be materialistic at Christmas because that's what God wants. Instead of admitting to that the church incorporated the pagan rite of a midwinter feast to celebrating life, which, boiled down, is the true meaning of Christmas, a celebration of life, he goes on forever about how that's not true. It's shot terribly. The camera is shaky and loses focus at times. That could be stylistic, but I can't tell since the director uses basic framing, having everyone in the center of the frame, so I can't tell if he's a genius or incompetent. As far as the story goes, the story has a 15 minute arc at best, but it's padded out to 80 minutes so by the end you've forgotten what the original story was about. The dialogue is stilted when it's not ADR, and it seems the actors have to reboot halfway through their lines. The visuals are garish and unappealing because they try so hard to be interesting. Honestly, I think I would like it better if Kirk Cameron just came out and admitted he wanted to throw a Christmas party at his house, so he hired a couple of friends to write a script so he could use it as a business write-off on his taxes. Still, I recommend this movie for a holiday viewing party. Why? So the world can know how not to make a Christmas movie. So gather up your friends and give it a try. Well. Thanks for stopping by, thanks for tuning in, and from all of us here at Bad Movie Friday Night, we wish to wish you a safe and happy Christmas. Bye y'all.